Welcome back, and today we have the presidency. So far, I've tried to present all of these topics around a common theme or some t- uh, or a major theory, and this week is no exception. In talking about the presidency, I think the best way to bring all of the different stuff together into one idea is to present it around a paradox. Not this paradox, but this paradox. The reality of the presidency is that today it is considered a very strong and powerful position, but the Constitution only provides very weak and very limited powers to the presidency. The powers given to the presidency through the Constitution do not match the view today of the presidency as a very powerful institution. The president is considered the leader of the country, but when the Constitution was written, that was something that the Founding Fathers intended for Congress to do. The reality is that the public demands presidents to act decisively today, and yet the Constitution does not provide all the powers to do so. So how did we get here? How do we have a presidency that, constitutionally speaking, is very weak, but in reality is actually very, very strong? We're going to walk through this by talking about four major duties or powers in Article 2 of the Constitution. These are powers given to the presidency, and and at the end of talking about these four powers, I hope that we'll be able to resolve the paradox um, and understand how today the presidency is considered a very powerful position despite the lack of constitutional powers given to him or her. First of all, the president is considered the head of state or the head of government. The president is considered the commander-in-chief. The president is considered the chief diplomat. And he's also considered a legislator or has a part in legislation and drafting of public policy. So let's start with head of state or government. Article 2 says, quote, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. But it doesn't really define what executive powers are. It does not have the same sort of laundry list of powers and authorities given to the president as was given to Congress. Remember, Article 1, Section 2 has a very long list of powers that Congress, the things Congress is allowed to do. So what are some of the powers listed in the Constitution to the presidency? Uh, First of all is appointment powers. We talked before about how the president can appoint members of the cabinet or uh, members of agencies. The president can appoint the secretary of state. The president can, can appoint the head of the Justice Department. And the president also can appoint judges, federal and Supreme Court. But both of these are limited by the Senate's advice and consent. So any nominee that the president puts forth, the Senate has to also affirm or vote in favor of. So again, as we talked about when we discussed the Constitution in week two, the presidential, the presidential powers given to it by the Constitution are somewhat limited. There are also some protections or other powers that the president has. One, the one we're going to talk about is executive privilege, which is the right to withhold information from Congress. Why would the president have the power to withhold information from Congress? Well, a lot of times it has to do with getting frank advice. If, for instance, uh, the Secretary of State and the Defense Department, if they feared that everything they told the president could be made public, then they would be very reluctant to make controversial recommendations to the president regarding foreign policy. And that could, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can see how that would undermine national security. So executive privilege is something that revolves around the president's ability to do his or her job. But there has been a lot of controversy over the years surrounding it. The big one were were the Nixon tapes. During Nixon's administration, his aides installed on the desk, or beneath his desk, a tape recorder that was voice activated. So whenever the president started talking with somebody, it would automatically record it. As it turns out, when Nixon was discussing things related to the Watergate break-in and the subsequent subsequent cover-up of that, he forgot to turn the tape recorder off. And during one of the hearings over the Watergate break-in, one of the people who worked for Nixon let it slip that this recording device was there and recorded the conversations. And so Congress subpoenaed those tapes. And President Nixon argued that that was 
fell under executive privilege. He did not have to hand over those tapes to Congress, and the Supreme Court stepped in and ruled on it, forcing him to hand it over. The reason they forced him to hand over those tapes was they said that executive privilege cannot impede a criminal investigation. There was a criminal investigation going on regarding Watergate, and that executive privilege did not cover the, that type of activity. In most other cases, though, the Supreme Court has upheld claims of executive privilege by the presidential administration. So the president has wide latitude by the courts to withhold information from Congress, especially as it relates to national security. And the president can claim executive privilege to prevent Congress from subpoenaing or otherwise getting that information. Another power that the president has is an executive order, which is simply a proclamation to change policy in the executive branch without congressional approval. A common example of this is an executive order that would give federal employees a half day off on Christmas Eve. That's obviously something that the president does not need um, a legislation from Congress in order to do. And so the president, as the chief executive, sort of like a CEO of a business, can make decisions that relate to the executive branch employees. There is, however, also controversy regarding the use of executive orders, and the use of executive orders has increased over the past 40, 50 years, presidents relying on it a lot more than in the past. One of the more controversial ones was an executive order regarding the NSA's wiretapping program. During President Bush's administration, President Bush signed an executive order, which, again, does not require congressional approval. Congress did not vote on it. In fact, Congress did not even know that the president had done this. He did, He signed an executive order and didn't tell anybody because this was intended as an anti-terrorism program, and President Bush felt that that could undermine national security by letting the public and Congress know about this program. Only a few members of Congress were told about its existence. When this came out, it became very controversial because a lot of people argued that under both the Bush and the Obama administration, that the use of executive order to enact a new policy intended to fight terrorism exceeded the president's constitutional authority. When the president writes an executive order, it typically does not get overruled or overturned. However, there are two mechanisms for repealing it or reversing an executive order that the president has signed. The first is that Congress can overturn the order with legislation. They can simply pass legislation that replaces whatever policy the president acted with the executive order. And therefore, Congress, for instance, once it was known about the NSA wiretapping program, Congress could have passed a law that repealed it. And second, a court can rule it unconstitutional. If Congress or a member of the public believes that the president has exceeded his authority in enacting and signing an executive order, they can take it to the courts, and the court, if it finds that the executive order does exceed the president's constitutional authority or that the, that the order itself violates some aspect of the Bill of Rights or some other part of the Constitution, then the courts will nullify the executive order. In reality, these are very rare. Congress very rarely overturns executive orders signed by the president, and the courts very rarely hear cases involving it, and when they do, they tend to side with the president. And so one of the reasons that the president is considered a very powerful position and has wide latitude to act independently has to do with executive orders that can create new programs or policies that do not require Congress's permission or their approval. And because the courts have given the presidency wide latitude in these orders and have been very reluctant to rule them unconstitutional or to otherwise try to limit the president's use of them. The president's also considered the commander-in-chief, basically just, just means the commander of the armed forces, and the president leads the military. And yet, only Congress has the power to declare war. So that would seem like a limit on the president's constitutional authority to lead the military. The reality, though, is that the president does lead in terms of military force. The political science jargon that we sometimes use is that the president has first mover authority. What that means is that the president can send troops into battle without requiring an act of Congress. Congress does not need to give the president that authority, and the president can send troops into battle without an act of war, without a declaration of war. But even here, 
the president must get congressional approval for the military conflict. So if the president sends troops into battle, he has 60 days under the War Powers Act before he has to either get congressional authorization to extend the conflict or he has to withdraw the troops. And then he, after that 60 days, has another 30 days for a withdrawal period. So again, the presidents do have wide latitude in order to lead the armed forces. And, and at least in terms of the military, the president probably is the most independent from Congress, being able to initiate conflicts using the military without congressional approval. And by the way, Congress is very reluctant with troops in battle in an active conflict situation Congress is very reluctant to withdraw money for that or to not extend the timeline to the president. And so, again, the reality of this is that the president takes a lead in matters of foreign policy. The president is also the chief diplomat. What this means is that he is the head person in terms of negotiating treaties in diplomacy and relations with foreign leaders. Here's a picture of President Obama awkwardly bowing to the king of Saudi Arabia. Here's President Obama awkwardly bowing to the Japanese prime minister. Here's President Obama appearing to bow to the pope. And that's not even a real king. And that's just a kid now. What's going on here? Actually, the story behind this picture, which President Obama's wife, Michelle Obama, mentioned at the DNC convention just yesterday, is that this young man visited the White House. And he looked at President Obama and he asked, does his hair feel like mine? And so the president bent over and allowed him to touch his hair. And it was a very touching moment. And, and Michelle Obama mentioned that, so I thought I'd put the picture in there. Okay, what do we mean by chief diplomat? Basically, the president has broad authority over diplomacy. But even here, in terms of negotiating treaties, he has to get congressional approval for the treaties. In particular, he ha the Senate has to sign off on any treaty that the president negotiates. That would seem like a severe limit, especially when you have a president of one party and a Congress of the other party. The two would have to negotiate pretty closely in order to agree on the terms of a treaty. The president could not, in that situation, just go on his own, negotiate a treaty, and expect for the Senate to ratify it. Here again, the reality is that the president actually has more authority than what the Constitution would indicate by the use of executive agreements. Executive agreements are used to bypass the Senate, and it's basically a deal or an agreement with another country. You can think about it as a mini-treaty. It has all the parts and looks of a treaty, but it doesn't require the Senate approval of it. Executive agreements are in force as long as both countries agree to the terms. It is not legally binding in the same way that a treaty is legally binding. A treaty has formal mechanisms for one or the other country to withdraw from it, and sometimes there are sanctions for breaking the treaty. An executive agreement, however, is voluntary. The next president can agree to the executive agreement made by the previous president, or the next president can simply repeal that agreement and pull out of it. If the other country involved no longer likes the agreement, they're not bound by it either. They can pull out at any time. So executive agreement gives the president a lot more authority and room to negotiate and enter relationships with other countries, trade deals, and so forth. But it lacks a strong enforcement mechanism or penalties for one or the other country pulling out. And more importantly, the next president can simply repeal it. Finally, the president has veto power, which makes the president a vital role in the legislative process. Here again, the Constitution included only a modest role in the legislative process. It gave the president the power to update the Congress once a year on the State of the Union. This has originally was simply a signed note to Congress that the president would send via carrier. Today, the State of the Union is a public address that gets major media attention, typically lasts about an hour and a half and it occurs sometime in January every year. And these are considered big, important events that all of the major networks will cover and talk about in the following days. The president also has a veto power. If you don't know what the veto power is, it's simply the president, if Congress passes a law, the president does not have to sign it. 
the president can refuse to sign it or can actually write veto on it, and in that legislation will not become law. So here again, even though the Constitution gives a modest role to the president in the legislative process, the public today demands a strong leader. In fact, most modern presidents enter office with an agenda and legislation that they propose to Congress. Interestingly, the president cannot actually submit legislation on the floor of the House or the Senate. The president cannot propose legislation to Congress. The president does, however, have a member of his party take the legislation that the president wants to propose and submit it on behalf of the president. And so sometime immediately after the president is elected and before they take office, they will typically have major legislation prepared so that once they take office, they can propose it to Congress and this period of the first 100 days of a president, new president's administration is considered a very important, vital time. It's a period of time when intense media attention is given to the president's agenda. And the presidents want to get as much of his agenda passed during that first 100 days as possible. And so again, this is just to highlight the point that whereas originally the president, in terms of the legislative process, was considered more of a clerk and could sign off on legislation or not, the president today actually takes an active role in leading the policymaking process, often with ambitious agendas during their first 100 days in office that they propose to Congress and then they try to pressure members of Congress to support. During this period, when the president proposes legislation before Congress, they will often ra try to rally the public against Congress and for the president's legislation, or at least against members of the opposition party in Congress. We call this going public. Going public is simply when the president tries to use the public to pressure Congress to pass his legislation. Now remember Mayhew's assumption, what do members of Congress care about force first and foremost? They care about re-election. And so if the public is supportive of the president's agenda, the members of Congress, even those of the opposing party, are going to be very reluctantly, are going to be very reluctant to oppose the president. And that role of the public forces Congress to negotiate with the president on legislation. So whereas the original intention behind the Constitution was for Congress to negotiate and deliberate within Congress, the House and the Senate, on legislation, craft the legislation, and send it to the president for approval or veto, now we have a situation where the president takes the lead in proposing policies, tries to pressure Congress to support those policies, and then Congress and the president enter a period of negotiation over the terms of that legislation. So yet again, an example of the president today taking a more active role and a stronger leadership role than was originally viewed in the Constitution. And the main point of this is that Public support is a major, major source of presidential power. When the president is popular, his agenda typically passes through Congress, and often very quickly and very easily. When the president is very unpopular, however, Congress is more likely to oppose the president's agenda. Again, going back to Mayhew's assumption, an unpopular president, members of Congress, especially those of the other party, are going to be very reluctant to side with the president especially when he's deeply unpopular, they're going to be more likely to oppose the president so that they can be on the side of the public so that they can get reelected. So let's wrap this up by resolving the original paradox that, we, that I presented. Again, the paradox is simply that the Constitution the founders provided only limited powers and weak powers to the executive branch, a clerical role, if you will. Yet today, the president is viewed as a powerful position, the leader of the free world, if you will, but certainly the leader of American politics. The president takes a more active role in military affairs. The president takes a more active role in the legislative process to the point of even leading the legislative process. And the fact is the presidents do have more power than in the past, particularly the War Powers Act, which allows the president to send troops into conflict for 60 days without congressional approval. The president only has to inform Congress that he has done this, and executive orders have expanded the president's ability to act in terms of foreign policy and domestic policy. But the presidents can still sometimes run into the original paradox we've talked about. The public demands a strong leader, and the president only has these clerical powers. There are a few unofficial powers that we just talked about, executive orders, executive agreements, 
but mostly the president's forced to rely on persuasion to go public, to try to rally the public behind his agenda and pressure Congress to pass that agenda. What that means, however, is that if the president's major source of power is public opinion, then when the president has low approval, when the public is not behind the president or is actively against the president, then the president is going to have problems governing. And the result of this is that a, any given president's power will rise and fall throughout their administration depending on how popular they are with the public. When the president is very popular, the office of the executive is indeed a very powerful position, and the president takes a leading role in things such as legislation, diplomacy, and foreign policy. When the president's very unpopular, however, he runs into the problem with only having weak clerical powers, and he has a problem passing his agenda. There's a lot more we could say about the American presidency. I hope this gives you some background on the institution and a different perspective on how we view the office of the presidency. But keep in mind, this is just an overview of the major points related to the political science literature and our understanding of the presidency. We teach an entire semester on just the presidency if you're interested in this topic. And I'd encourage you to sign up for those courses if you're interested. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about the Wyoming Constitution, and then we're going to talk about the judicial branch of government, and particularly the Supreme Court. See you next time.